Comfy? Yes, thank you. Always comfy here. The chairs got slightly smaller of late. Is this uh, <laughs> LWG having a problem? Cash flow crisis? No, it's... <laughs> Actually, no, mine is smaller. Yours is slightly larger. It's slightly it? higher. Mm. Yes. I like it that Definitely way. Definitely hierarchy there. <laughs> now, about your film, which is splendid, American Friends, it's mm. uh, the story of your great grandfather, an Oxford don and traveller. Yeah. But here, you are, as him, refreshing yourself in Switzerland. The largest of the three summits is the Feinster Elhorn, 14,032 feet above sea level. The area is a well-known haunt of the chamois, a shy retiring antelope which shelters amongst the rocks during the heat of the day. On a fine day, the Matterhorn may be glimpsed between the twin peaks of the Weisshorn <laughs> and Mount Everest. Extraordinary. <laughs> yes. Oh, what a pity we didn't bring our watercolors. <laughs> Not family viewing. Oh, but a family resemblance, I expect. Well, I don't know. I never saw him that closely. <laughs> <laughs> was that as refreshing as it looked? Actually, it was quite pleasant, yes. Um, I, was, I was rather, rather friendly. Someone asked me, you know, about that scene and said, um, did you use a body double like uh, Julia Roberts? <laughs> yes. I said, well, you know, I'd love to have used Julia Roberts. Look nothing like at all. But, uh, I did it all myself. And uh, when we got to Switzerland, I sort of asked what it's like, and people said, you can't go under a waterfall. I mean, that water comes straight off the glacier. It's all minus 43 degrees centigrade. It'll kill you. Um, but it had been in my great-grandfather's diary. It actually had said how he took all his clothes off and bathed in this pool and then ran around to, to try and get dry. So I thought, well, I've got to do it. And actually, on the day we got round to it, we found that actually that the water was flowing quite gently over huge sort of boulders, which had got very, very hot in the sun, because that was the middle of last summer, very, very hot indeed. So it was really rather pleasant. Lovely. So Is it out about minus 20? <laughs> oh, no, yes. I don't mind. <laughs> no problems at all. It's minor surgery. <laughs> no, absolutely back to normal. But he went on to have seven children, so it's extraordinary. But was it a, hmm. <laughs> was it a, a true story with embellishments or what? Well, the truth of the story was that my great-grandfather was an Oxford Don, and at the age of about 40, he did go to Switzerland on a walking holiday by himself, and he did meet two American ladies, and one of them was a 17-year-old, and he did reveal in his diary that he was very, very fond of her, obviously sort of fell in love with her, uh, had a little holiday romance. Then there's a big gap in the story, and then uh, you find out that they actually did marry. He says in his diary, he says, uh, when they come to leave each other in Switzerland, if only our ages had been closer, how different things might have been. Then there's an asterisk, and in different coloured ink at the bottom of the page, he's, he's written, we married in Paris in 1867, she's made me the happiest of men. So he obviously, he married her. Had to give up his entire career, because Oxford Dons were not allowed to be married. It was entirely sort of bachelor, monastic existence. So he gave up his, his very sort of successful career. And, uh, and married her. So that, that much is known, the bit in the middle. It's a rude bit. I uh, invented myself. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they my director, happily. Mr. Tristan Paul. Were, were, were they very revealing diaries? I mean, was he a wild sort of fellow? Um, no, I don't think sort of... He was a Latin scholar, really. I think he did very few opportunities for wildlife, really. But when he went to Switzerland, um, which is really the only diary that exists, on his walking holiday, he did have a sort of... He had an eye for a pretty girl. He kind of mentioned meeting girls, and then, of course, he took all his clothes off occasionally. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, there was no sort of direct drug references. Uh, <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't, you know, particularly naughty. Left the sheep alone. <laughs> so, cut that bit. <laughs> the um, the mm. Palins are an interesting bunch. Your grandfather was a character, wasn't he? Yes, I found out a bit, bit more about him. He was a doctor, a country doctor in Norfolk. And his great speciality was to do... Uh, he did tonsil operations in the kitchen on Sundays. <laughs> um, <laughs> after church. <laughs> that was his line. Pre-booper, you see. They were all, they were all <laughs> the go. They were all making a bit of money out of the medicine. And that was his thing, was to actually lay people on the kitchen table, take their tonsils out after church. Maybe during church, I don't know. This wasn't a euphemism, taking out the tonsils, was it? 
What's a euphemism? Sorry, sorry Mark, you, you must have done. No, I think, he, I think he did take out the actual tonsils, yes. He didn't take out anything else. So that's what <laughs> the, uh, the pale in women is certainly not bit. shrinking violets either, are they? Uh, what? The, the pale in women. The pale in women? No, the pale in women are sort of strong, very strong matriarchal lot, I think. Uh, certainly, my great-grandmother, who was in the film, is a, she, she actually was an Irish orphan from the potato famines of the 1840s, and he, he met her and married her, and she then ran the relationship, I think. And they settled down this, this little sort of uh, parish in, in Herefordshire, and he built a vicarage there. And so apparently she made him move it four feet to the left, <laughs> which is an apocryphal story, I'm sure, but she was obviously a very dominating lady. You will soon be getting ready to leave your own family again, won't you? Yes, I'm off on a little walk. A little walk? Well, <laughs> we'll see. Um, it's going, uh, uh, we're going to try and do a sort of, it's not a sequel to Around the World in 80 Days, but another sort of epic journey. And I'm going to go from the North Pole to the South Pole through Russia and Africa by public transport. <laughs> if, the right, <laughs> if the right bus comes along. And he was never seen again. But after your experience of that world trip before, you must be making special preparations. Yes, I'm taking double strength diarrhea pills. <laughs> I'm taking 40 tonnes of diarrhea pills. That's about it. It's funny because it's been said that because of that television series, one in four people has seen you on the loo. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be one in six when we were <laughs> exhibitionist days. Yes, it is strange, isn't it? You know, it's a private thing. And then, I, in fact, I think it was actually part of the appeal of the series was, was that you had a presenter who, instead of going to the loo before he did his appearance on television, <laughs> went to the loo while he was on television <laughs> uh, and had diary at the same time. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to see a lot more of Alan Wicker on the loo from now on. A lot of presenters are actually, uh, you know, working out a few diseases they can catch. Well, we could have changed this set for next week's show. It'd be rather interesting. <laughs> Will you be taking... It's actually about this size, I must say, the <laughs> one that I went, used in the Persian Gulf. The terrible problem is you go into one of those loos, which is just really a basket with a hole cut in the bottom, and, I mean, you just feel being British, well, well that's what one chap can't do very much. You just know, so sit there, and it's a lovely ocean. You've heard all about some green peace and polluting the ocean and the North Sea, and you oh, God, I can't do anything in that. You know, it's lovely. It's the only piece of un unsullied ocean in the world, and there you are. So for about three days, I, I couldn't go at all. Oh, that says a lot for you, really. On the 4th, of course, was it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know about ecological disasters, I don't need to tell you about oil slicks, but... Uh, Fortunately, it'd be mixed up with the oil stick they've got there now. No one will notice. <laughs> oh, dear me. The, uh, will you uh, be taking little reminders of home? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes. I shall. <laughs> I shall be taking my bank manager and <laughs> man from the garage. Uh, no, I mean, little photo of the family, I suppose. I don't mm. actually travel usually with family albums. I mean, it's all in there. Yes. Um, and, and I shall miss them, of course. Now, it's time for a bit of activity on the podium. Uh, provided no... I went before I came. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's it's one-track mind, this interview, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, yeah. Well, the activity I was thinking of is being provided tonight by a girl who intends to be a very big star indeed. She's been voted Lip of the Year, Ultimate Object of Desire and Top Cultural Icon. <laughs> <laughs> As you see, all awards that Michael and I have on our own mantelpiece <laughs> from Transvision 